Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in today's video we're going to be answering a relatively simple question. Could we somehow redirect the asteroids from the asteroid belt and collide it with the planet Mars, giving it not only liquid water, but also raising its temperature, possibly creating atmosphere that way, and essentially terraforming it the easy way? This was actually a question from one of you wonderful people on Facebook, and today we're going to try to answer it. Welcome to What The Math. So colonizing Mars and specifically terraforming Mars is a very, very difficult mission, a lot more difficult than media portrays it. And one of the people on Facebook by the name of William Duke sent me a message earlier asking me, so, you know, is it possible for us to actually go into the asteroid belt, which is right between Mars and Jupiter and contains objects such as Ceres and Vesta. And is it possible for us to basically redirect these large rocks full of water and other amazing stuff and to then somehow collide it with Mars? Well, theoretically, of course, it's possible, but let's actually talk about the practical implications. But first, let's actually imagine that we did that. We, we redirected quite a few large rocks from the asteroid belt and collided them with Mars. So, let's see the effects. We're going to take the uh, largest, most common asteroids from the asteroid belt and redirect them on the collision with Mars. Now, we've actually discovered uh, close to a million of uh, asteroids of various sizes in the asteroid belt, and uh, we obviously cannot redirect all of them. We're just going to focus on the big ones. So, for example, Ceres, which is right here, contains about a third of the total mass of the asteroid belt. Vesta, it's slightly smaller neighbor and also um, asteroids like Pallas right here, uh, Hygieia, um, Ephrosyne and a few other ones all together contain over a half of the total mass so we're just going to focus on the big ones. So let's just launch them at Mars and uh, see what happens to this beautiful planet. And so here's a bunch of them approaching from different sites. This is sort of imaginary, of course, and very likely would never occur, but let's just say that we've reached the point in history where we can actually easily redirect asteroids. And so all of them are now going to be colliding with beautiful Mars. We're going to go to Mars, look at its uh, climate here and temperature, and basically observe the collisions as they occur and observe things like atmospheric pressure or I guess, um, atmospheric mass here and the surface pressure and of course greenhouse effect as well so here we go first one is Ceres and as you can see they're actually relatively tiny compared to Mars but they will obviously cause some dramatic changes on the planet the temperature jumped to about 1100 degrees and um, things will take a while to basically stabilize so we're going to advance time now uh, watch all of these collision happen in real time, I guess. And um, a lot of this, what basically this will cause is, it will obviously cause the release of a lot of the um, water ices underneath the surface. It will melt pretty much the entire ice deposits on the planet and very likely release a lot of this into, into the atmosphere. But there's two problems, of course. One of these problems is that most of the water will probably escape into outer space. And the second problem is that because Mars still has no magnetic field, the rest of the water will escape into space over time. Sun will very likely uh, strip the rest of the atmosphere like it did in the past. And so without any um, magnetic field, which Mars still doesn't actually have here, I believe it's under materials, there is still no magnetic field. And without, without the magnetic field, it will unfortunately lose the atmosphere. Now, uh, William Duke actually did uh, mention that, you know, what if we collide these asteroids so hard that it somehow restarts the magnetic field, um, basically melting the inner core of Mars. But the problem is that, first of all, we're not 100% sure how exactly the magnetic field is created using the outer and inner cores of different planets. And the second thing is that just colliding things into objects does not really restart the magnetic field. It's not as easy as that. It does require quite a lot of other scientific things to take place for it to actually work. But anyway, so let's just assume that we're not going to worry about the magnetic field just yet. Let's just see what actually happens to the planet after it cools down and after it gets back to sort of normal temperature and I guess pressure. So we're going to decrease this to about 100 degrees and cool it down and let's see what will actually happen to the surface of Mars. And as you can see, it's already transforming, sort of becoming a little bit different from before, but 
because the greenhouse effect here is still very, very low and because the atmospheric pressure hasn't really increased that much, chances are it's going to return to being super, super cold like it was before. Also, in terms of the actual water content, for some reason it didn't really increase that much. Even though it should have received water from Ceres, I guess most of the water evaporated and disappeared. Or possibly uh, got completely thrown off the surface from all of these collisions. But let's just say that some of the water actually stayed. Some of the water will actually stay here, create a bit of an atmosphere, and possibly just a little bit of surface ice. So for the moment here, we might actually have some liquid water. Just for the moment. But it will not last, because the temperature is still dropping, there is close to no atmospheric pressure still, and so over time Mars will actually return to, to being what it was before. And I think in this simulation it will actually take uh, just a few months for it to return back to being frozen uh, desert self. So right around now, things will start becoming icy and here you go, Mars is back to being somewhat uninhabitable and somewhat Martian-like. So not exactly terraformed at all. So colliding things with things doesn't really make things more habitable. It just makes explosions and makes it look pretty for a while, but then that's it. So that's clearly not going to work. Now let's talk about the other problem, redirecting those actual asteroids. And let's look at Ceres, because that's probably the best example we can focus on. So how do we, would we actually redirect Ceres to Mars? Well, the main way of doing this is to basically uh, somehow decrease the total speed of Ceres so its orbit actually intersects with orbits of Mars. And here uh, we refer to this as delta V, basically the change in velocity. And in other words, Ceres would actually have to change its velocity by about 6 kilometers per second. So if I change this to about 16 right now, uh, or not 16, sorry, 13, uh, it might actually intersect with Martian orbit at some point in the future. So there it is, it's going to intersect Mars. It doesn't even have to be that low apparently, it can maybe even be 15. So there we go. So if we were to decrease the speed, um, the total orbital speed of Ceres by about four kilometers per second, we would be able to somehow intersect with Mars and collide it. But here's the problem. Ceres and other asteroids in this particular region are very, very massive. And if you remember anything about physics, to change uh, a velocity of an object, you need a lot of energy, and specifically the energy here equals to mass times velocity squared. So if we want to change the velocity by about 4,000 meters per second, that's essentially squaring this number, basically getting a number that's like 16 million, and then multiplying it by the total mass. Long story short, you need a lot and a lot of energy. As a matter of fact, just to change the velocity of Ceres to intersect with Mars, we would need uh, something uh, similar to the total production of total energy on our planet Earth right now, multiplied by 500 years. It's ridiculously, ridiculously high. I'm going to demonstrate it to you just uh, in a second by going to Ceres again and colliding it with a minor asteroid that we'll just pick from, from the list here. Uh, now, the collision here will be equivalent to about maybe a thousand or several thousand uh, nuclear strikes. Basically, you know, launching a lot of nuclear weapons at the side of Ceres will be equivalent to this particular collision that I'm about to launch at it. And what we're watching here is we're watching the total velocity. So right now it's 19.1 kilometers per second. We're going to see how much this changes. And so here we're going to launch an object known as Swift Total Comet. It's about 13 kilometers in radius. And what we're going to be watching is the total velocity of Ceres. And so yeah, it decreased by a tiny, tiny amount from about 19.1469 to about 19.1462. So it's essentially very insignificant change. We would need to do this like thousands of times and I'm gonna see if I can do this a few times just so you can see the velocity changing. Uh, we would need to do, to do this a lot. We would need to do this so many times for it to actually reach the velocity of about 16 kilometers per second that we needed to change uh, its orbit to intersect with Mars. As you can see, it's slowly decreasing, but it's still 19.1. It still hasn't even changed by um, one decimal point. So this would require tremendous amounts of energy. So much as a matter of fact that we just cannot produce that much just yet. We're not at that point yet. And as you can see, Ceres has already warmed up and became 
uh, colonizable itself. It became sort of terraformed and it's losing a lot of its uh, atmosphere and a lot of its water because of the change in temperature. But the velocity is still 19.1. I think I've collided about what, maybe 30 rocks now, maybe a little bit more. It hasn't really changed that much. So let's just uh, maybe keep doing it until we decrease it to about 19 kilometers per second and see if we can actually at least get to that point. So this is what, like 50 now, about 50 collisions and still at 19 as you can see, 19.1 uh, that is. Still not there just yet. Still not even close to there. As a matter of fact, we're still at 19.14. So this will take me close to about 1000 collisions. And by then, Sirius is going to be super, super hot, very, very, very molten. And very likely, uh, we could maybe just do something else with all of this extra energy that we just spent instead of colliding it with Mars. So what have we learned from all of this? Well. One is that redirecting things in space is not a very easy uh, business. It's actually very, very challenging. Redirecting large, massive bodies is even more challenging, although very, very pretty. And lastly, redirecting asteroids to Mars and colliding them with Mars is also pretty, but not particularly useful. It's not going to really create much in terms of atmosphere. It might melt the ice, but it also might release all of this ice into the outer space, so we might lose this water completely. And so long story short, redirecting asteroids to Mars? Mm, maybe not. Maybe not this time. Maybe never. It is definitely fun though, and it's definitely very beautiful. Anyway, so thank you so much William Duke for asking this question. I definitely wanted to explore this a little bit more in Universe Sandbox, and hopefully this answers your question. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Well, we're going to learn something else, so don't forget to come back tomorrow because there's going to be another educational video using uh, video games or possibly we'll just play something else together. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, give you later, and as always, bye-bye. And don't forget to space out. Happy New Year, everyone. Hope you have a great year.